happy our land. And based on our sold out registration, I don't think it will be. So thank you again for registering early and helping us get this off the ground. I am Cheryl Gall. I'm the treasurer of the Michigan Pet Fund Alliance. The Michigan Pet Fund Alliance started back in around 2003 by the lady sitting here to my left, Miss Debbie Judd. Um, and we started out just working in our own county, Oakland County, and quickly found out that we needed to spread this across the state so that we could become the first no pill state. And that's our goal. And I hope that's all. Um, I'd like to recognize our conference sponsors, um, which help make this conference possible and help to keep the registration dollars um, affordable for all of us who are trying to use our money to help the pets. Our sponsors were Pet Finder and True Patch. Can we give them a quick round of applause? And we also want to recognize uh, Pet Supply Plus and Specialties Inc. Animal Care for the product that they've donated today. Um, also Animal Rescues of Michigan. Um, they gave us a generous contribution so that we were able to underwrite the videotaping so that this will be available on our website anyone that wants to see it that either wants to look at some of the sessions they weren't able to attend or for those people that were not able to attend today. And I also want to thank um, Humane Society of Huron Valley for arranging the wonderful tours to their state-of-the-art facility. Those of you that have had a chance to go, it's a great tour. So enjoy those that are going this afternoon. Um, let's move on. We'll move on to our opening session. Um, our first speaker is going to be the chair of the Michigan Pet Fund, Ms. Deborah Shutt. It's her planning expertise that put this together. She is an urban planner. I won't tell you how many years, but many. Um, actually, a, ma a master urban planner. Um, she is certified with the American Institute of Certified Planners. She is a licensed city planner in the state of Michigan. She is a nationally certified Main Street Manager. And again, it's been her expertise that has made all of this flow very easily for the rest of us that work on the committee. Over and above that planning expertise, her real passion is saving and finding homes for the adoptable pets in the state of Michigan. She started out as a foster mom, took in many puppies who needed help, and had a bad experience with one of her litters. One of the puppies was deemed um, to have a behavior problem. And even though she agreed to take the puppy, pay for behavior um, help, the puppy was put down anyway. And she decided that was not acceptable. And so Oakland Pet Fund and now the Michigan Pet Fund Alliance was started. So I will introduce to you my guiding light, Ms. Deborah Shutt. Good morning. How is everybody today? I cannot tell you how excited I am that today has arrived. You know, human beings, since like I think the beginning of time, humans have had a tradition that they like recognizing the best. And I don't care if it's the Olympics, if it's the Super Bowl, if it's in a professional field, doctor, lawyer, engine chief, whatever it is, we like to notice who's the one that really excels, who's really good at doing their job. And so the Pet Fund also wanted to know who was really good at doing their job. And I know everybody, I'm sure most everybody in this room knows this form, right? Many of you maybe have filled out this Department of Ag form, and so many of us have downloaded it from their website. And whether it was to see how the shelter next door is doing compared to how you're doing, or maybe it's like we're going to give what for to whomever with their numbers, 
But, you know, everyone, I mean, a good number of you, I'm sure, are familiar. And we said, there's so many of them, wouldn't it be nice to figure out where everybody stands? And so we took that challenge this year to find out where everybody stood. There was 152 shelters. We took each form and we figured out the save rate for each shelter. And then we ranked those save rates to try to understand who's on top and who's not even close to the top. And you know, we did this for several reasons. And I would like to say we, we didn't do it to embarrass anyone, but I would be lying to you if I told you that. <laughs> Because embarrassment means that innocent animals are dying. And that is just not acceptable. So we need to inform, enlighten, and move forward. We wanted to know what Michigan shelters were doing a great job and find out if Michigan had any shelters that were no-kill. We wanted to recognize and award those doing a great job. We wanted to hold those shelters up as the yardstick. They're getting it right. And we also wanted to inform the public so that they could demand accountability of their tax dollars and their charitable contributions. But most importantly, we wanted to take the wind out of any argument that no kill is unreasonable, it's impossible, it can't be done, you know, it's a matter of open admission versus closed or, or limited. Nobody knows what that means, but you know, it just, one can do it, one can't, small can, large can't, rural can, urban can't. But you know what? None of those things are true. Everybody can. So let's now get to that no kill equation. For those of you, who's, who's read Nathan's book? Oh, well, a good number of you. Got to tell you, you've got one now. I expect by the next conference, everyone will have read it. And I have to tell you, it is not an easy read. It is a difficult read because the content itself is very, um, makes you heart sick at times. And sometimes you have to just put it down. And in other times, it's just wrapping your brain around the concepts that's difficult. So, no kill. You're familiar with uh, that controversial term. We want to talk about what no kill is and what no kill isn't. Well, I'll tell you that it is claimed by those who aren't. And if you are a rescue organization, or a limited admission shelter, and you call yourself no-kill, I want you to know you truly are incorrectly using the word. No-kill is reserved for open admission shelters, period. They either are or they aren't. So if you are a limited admission shelter, if you are a rescue and you are saving 90% or better of those animals in your care, you are an adoption guarantee facility or an adoption guarantee organization. So when we misuse the word, and I'm sure the majority of people that misuse it do not do it intentionally, it's because we all know so little about this entire revolution. But when you use it and you say, we're a no-kill rescue, do you have any idea how difficult it is for those who have to make choices every single day to develop new programs, to get more fosters, to, a, to achieve that goal, when in fact, as a rescue, you are already limiting your intake. So it's not meant to say one is better than another, but when we don't use the words correctly, 
The problem is that the public doesn't know it correctly and there's more mass confusion. We have to make sure that we clear up the confusion. Adoption guarantee, limited admission shelter and rescue. It's rejected by some that are close to. And why do they reject being called no kill? Because it's so gosh darn controversial. The word is. And you know, we would be better served if we had a different terminology. And I think since the, the Oakland Pet Fund or the Michigan Pet Fund has been around since 2003, we're like, how do we capture it? And some say, no more homeless, no more homeless pets. Mm, that's just way too warm and fuzzy. Doesn't really quite do it. So if, that's my challenge to you. If you can come up with a new term that's not a lightning rod, let us know. We probably need to start using it. What is it not? It is, if I can make the button work, it is not keeping alive sick or suffering pets. And there is this misconception, and that's why the general public's like, it is inhumane. What on earth? That dog is dying of cancer, it's at its last legs and you won't euthanize it. Doesn't have a thing to do with no kill. No kill does euthanize. And if the animal is sick and suffering, and it cannot be made treatable, rehabilitated, then euthanasia, which is a kind thing to do for the animal, is implemented. It is not keeping alive dangerous animals. That would be the worst thing that we would want to do. There are methods for figuring out what dangerous animals are. They are not perfect. They are far from perfect. As a matter of fact, some of the temperament testing that is commonly used in shelters was developed for the specific reason of getting rid of most of the animals. Yeah. And so if you're using some of the common behavioral temperament tests, understand that even some of the authors of those tests will tell you that their animals that they have as pets won't pass. So you have to rethink about that differently, but no kill is not keeping dangerous animals. It is not saving only domestic cats. Why on earth we feel that wild animals either should be coming into shelters, which feral cats are, and then we just kill them because you can't adopt them. Duh, what do you bring them into the shelter for in the first place? <laughs> We're not bringing in squirrels. <laughs> We're not bringing in raccoons. They're wild. Leave them there. And above all, it's us. It's the two-legged that caused the problem to begin with. The cats didn't cause the problem. They're not indigenous. We did that. Leave them alone. Except the TNR, of course. And this one here is, it does not mean keeping a dog in a, or a cat in a cage for a shelter for a year. And I have to tell you, there's way too many people doing that. And that is yeah. inhumane. Um, that's not to say that, oh, it's six months is up, you know, rover goes down. No, that means that you need to be incredibly creative. You need to be more uh, collaborative. You need to be doing something different because rover or Miss Kitty does not deserve a life in a cage for a year or even six months. So what is this no-kill thing? It's the unmitigated desire and will, and I wanna say will, 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 because it is all about your will to rehome all cats and dogs that are healthy and treatable. It's an implementation of a systematic, proven approach. And that, oops, I went too far, didn't I? <laughs> yep. 
systematic, proven approach of 21st century best, best practices. What the heck does that mean? I'm a planner. Planners start with inventorying existing conditions, finding out what the lay of the land is. We do statistics. We try to understand them. We develop programs to address them. If they don't work, we rethink it. We measure success. We do results. That's why when I first found out when I was 40-some years old, a little while ago, that we were still doing the same thing in a lot of shelters that we were doing when I was eight years old, I went, what the heck is going on? Why on earth haven't we implemented systematic proven approaches to sheltering like we have public health? So, and it is about the best thing for the individual animal and the collective group that you have in your care. Finally, most importantly, it's about being creative, innovative, collaborative, and transparent. <coughs> so where do you start? How many people are familiar with the Asilomar Accords? Oh, a good number of you, thank goodness. But that's exactly where you start and you start using them. And they are based on a definition of folks that got together in 2004 to figure out, can we agree to anything? And they put together definitions for a healthy dog or cat, and you can find it on the web. It's a silomar.org, I believe. And they have definitions for healthy, they have definitions for what is treatable, and in that treatable, you're either rehabilitated or manageable. And then we have unhealthy and untreatable, and those are the animals that once they are in that classification are not killed, they are euthanized, and that's the difference. Euthanization is for humane reasons. Killing is when we look at a dog or a cat that is healthy, that is treatable, and we choose to end their life anyway. Now, this is an Asilomar mapping, and I don't know if anybody's ever done this, but I gotta tell you, you can lie with the Asilomar Accords just like you can lie with any other figures. And so you go, oh, you know, that one's not healthy. It's beyond repair. Oh, really? What's wrong with it? Oh, it has food aggression. Really? Yeah, it's been, uh, it was a stray. We're, we're guessing maybe six months it was out there. And, and it goes toward a bowl of food? And it gets cranky? So this is a classification. This is an example of one. You, you've got to do it yourself within your own rescue and your own shelter. And you need to describe what is it that's healthy, what is it that's treatable and rehabilitatable, what is it that's manageable. Is a dog with diabetes manageable? If you had to give insulin twice a day, is that manageable or is that unhealthy? How about cancer? How about parvo? And you know what? This will change. Because if you have limited resources, you cannot afford to treat every parvo dog you have. It's very expensive. But when you get to the point that your resources are increased, then parvo may no longer be an unhealthy and untreatable situation. So this is a living document that can change over time, depending on your situation. So you start there. I have to check for time because you know what? I could like use up all of Tanya's time and <laughs> tour and you name it and I don't want to do that. So when it gets to be like five after, get the hook, okay? <laughs> so we have 11 programs and I have no way in heck I'm going to get through the 11 programs of the no-kill equation, but this is what makes it work. I'm going to tell you just a couple of them that I find fascinating. Oh, I'll list all 11 of them if you don't know. And everybody should be practicing at least nine of these programs and participating in the last two. Proactive redemption. What the heck does that mean? It means uniting the lost 
cat with its owner. And we have traditionally said, lock your pet, okay, what are we gonna do for you for the shelter? Fill out the lost pet form, okay? Some people go as far as posting the lost pet form on a website. When I became more involved in animal welfare, in my county, there are seven open admission shelters, several limited admission shelters, and there are literally 100 rescues. If I've lost my dog, where the heck do I look? Right? And it's been one of these ones, it's your problem. Lost your dog, it's your problem, right? What? Why don't you keep them fenced up like you should have? You've broken the law, you know. You, you know that traditionally, we redeem between one and two percent of, of the cats and 20% of the dogs that are lost. Now there's a program in Nevada where they are redeeming 54% of the dogs that are getting back to their owners. It is proactive. Some of the things that they do that are different, their animal control officers never return to the shelter until they have made at least six stops in the neighborhood to see if someone identifies the cat or the dog before they ever go back <laughs> to the shelter. Knock on the door. Kids are out playing ball. Do you know this dog? You know? Let's not take them back if we don't have to take them back. There's the typical what most people do, right? The tags, the chips, whatever, match it up that way. How about lost pet counselors? Do you have any lost pet counselors that tell people what to do, that counsel them? Did you know we have three shelters? Did you know you live by the edge of the county? You might want to look at the county to the south of us or the one to the east of us. Dogs run, cats don't. I was amazed when I found out that if your indoor cat escapes, Studies show it will not go further than seven homes away from you. They're right around you. And so you know what they're doing? They're scared as all get out. So you go out looking, and this kitty's hiding because this is like, wow, I didn't get out here before. <laughs> this is like a scary place. Does your, does your counselor say, you know what, you, what you need to do is get your friends and your neighbors together for a volunteer night search team. How about reverse posting, <coughs> where the shelter takes the dog, takes a picture of it, and then goes out to the phone pole and says, this is where we picked up this dog, anybody know it? And how about cold case files? Do you have anyone working cold case files? Or distant shelter checks? Well, it is amazing that because when this kitty finally comes out, first of all, they've been told that they've, uh, the coyotes have gotten them, right? Did you know they did a study of 1,400 coyotes to find out what their diets were? <laughs> <laughs> Did you also know that only 1.4% of the coyotes ate a cat? It might have your cat. The bottom line is, you know what? The coyote probably did not eat your cat. It is not what they eat. They eat rodents. They eat smaller rodents. I believe that it. it's something I heard. Oh, yeah, the coyote got him. You know what happened? Miss Kitty's been hiding for two weeks. Miss Kitty came out. They got picked up by animal control. It's two weeks later. They've already been told that it's been eaten by a coyote, so she's not looking anymore. So that's a cold case file. And you can have volunteers matching descriptions against the cat that comes in two weeks later, four weeks later, six weeks later, or six months later. But I find it amazing there's an entire science here that we need to be following up on. Comprehensive adoption programs, you know those things. Holy cow, I love the shelters that are open from 10 to 2. <laughs> Aren't they your hours? Yeah. I, I give Cheryl a hard time tell her it's banker's hours. The worst in banker's hours. Anyway, for goodness sakes, it's got to be open when people are around. Weekends. Train staff are great. Friendly counter people, an absolute necessity. 
off-site adoptions, incentives, you name it, hard to adopt animal program. The folks up north, the Lonely Hearts Club, it's a new program they started. It's the, the cat in the shelter that's not moving. So how do you do an entire campaign about the dog that's been there too long? That's what you do. You single out the heart of, oh, for goodness sake, work with a rescue. Maybe they'll help you on it. But we have to be more creative. OK, pep retention. Oh, I got two minutes, and I got like nine programs to go. How fast can I be? <laughs> we got to let people keep their animals that want to keep them. And you know what? Food banks are obvious, because you know whether it's Meals on Wheels, Every county has a Meals on Wheels program. Why the heck aren't we stocking it so that they can deliver to their cats and dogs and they don't share their meals with their, that they have to eat? How about the people that are out of work? They need the food banks. Behavior counseling. I'm picking up poor Miss Kitty. She's escaped and now you know what she's doing. She's not using the darn litter box. So, right? No one's bothered to find out why Miss Kitty's doing that, so we just bring Miss Kitty to the shelter. Unless, of course, you have behavior counseling and you can help them figure out why Miss Kitty stopped using that. Temporary fosters, you know there is a huge need for fosters. I, I was contacted, I have been contacted probably by three or four people in the last six months that need a three month foster for their animal. And it's because they're temporarily in housing flux and they don't want to give up their animal and they don't have family to, to keep their animal. So there's all kinds of programs that can be done and they don't cost money. Rescue groups, oh my goodness. And I'm, I, I could spend the entire afternoon on rescue groups because everybody in this room either knows the killer organization, which is the shelter, or the shelter knows the crazies. <laughs> Hello, we both have the same goal. So what do we need to do? Shel uh, shelters need to give those rescues another try. When you've had problems with them, not everybody, you know, not, don't let that one bad apple spoil things. The other thing is, is that rescues need to step up and they need to develop more capacity. I cannot tell you the number of times I have called a rescue and never received a return phone call. That's inexcusable. You absolutely have to bring up the level of services within rescues. And then maybe we can have a better dialogue with those killer shelters that are also working to save animals. Medical behavior program. Every, oh, I've got a foster. Did I skip one? I don't know. I, I don't have much time, but you know, we have fosters. They are absolutely angels on earth. If they're like most fosters, you know what? They bring in the food, they bring in the cage, they bring in the medicine, they do everything else. They expand your budget by a bazillion dollars. So have them. Medical behavior problems, then another way you can use volunteers, have somebody who's an expert on food aggression, a foster that's an expert on it. How about another one that knows how to deal with separation anxiety? There's all kinds of things you can do to expand your resources. Rescue groups, behavior benefit, okay, volunteers, public relations in the community. Oh my goodness, I just love it. What shelter is located downtown? Okay. What shelter is located in the strip center? What shelter is located out of the way? <laughs> Hello, we're in competition, especially with the puppy stores. You ever see a puppy store all by itself in the woods? <laughs> Never, never, never. That community, your community needs to know exactly where you're located. They need to support you. They need to be the first rah-rah for you. That needs money. I mean, love Del Harvey. Del we're going to recognize later today. 
But she worked with the newspaper and the businesses and said, you know what, I can't afford to place the ads in the paper every week. But the auto dealer could sponsor one of my dogs in his ad, and she made that happen. There's all kinds of things that you can do, and you know what? When your community loves and respects you, you will not have a financial program that is a problem because they support you financially, too. Now, TNR, do I have one minute left? I'm way over. <laughs> High volume spay neuter clinics and TNR. TNR really needs to be done on a county basis. The high volume spay neuter clinics, we do not need 83 of them, one in every county, but we do need them throughout the state. The one thing I want to say on high volume spay neuter clinics, this is a big one. Irresponsible <coughs> pet owners, they're responsible for overpopulation, those nasty people. <laughs> Excuse me, 70% of pet owners spay and neuter. 3% are responsible for 80% of the shelter inhabitants. And if that's the case, 3%, find out who they are. For goodness sakes, most often they're people who cannot afford to spay and neuter. So all of us in this room had better never say again, those darn people who just don't spay and neuter because the majority of them either do or they don't have the financial ability to. And my last one here, compassionate leader, if you don't have one in a shelter, I don't care. If your top banana is not a leader, and I say compassionate, replace them. Get them replaced. Because I'm gonna tell you something. You can talk until you're blue in the face. You can jump up and down and go crazy. And you know what? Things won't change. Where's Cindy? Cindy, you're in the room. Cindy right here is with Concerned Citizens for Livingston's Homeless Pets. We worked for what, a year, year and a half? Almost two years. We did everything. We begged, barred, plead. You know, Dana? Where's Debbie? Debbie, are you in the room here? Debbie, stand up. Uh. Debbie is the new shelter director. 